The Christmas story is really all about contrasts. Months before the first Christmas, an angel was sent from heaven to an obscure town held in contempt by many to give the greatest news of history to a young woman who wasn't even married yet and to her fiancé. This couple later had to travel to another small village where God Almighty would be born as a little baby and laid in the feeding trough of a cave because there was no room in the inn. The first visitors to this divine child were simple shepherds, blue-collar workers who had a rather poor reputation, while the next visitors who came were prestigious foreign dignitaries who brought rich gifts. This is really a picture of contrasts throughout. Now this morning I want to turn our attention uh, to those foreign dignitaries as seen in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 begins, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is born King of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. I realize this is a little bit of a deviation from our theme this Christmas season, focusing on the names and titles of Jesus under the heading, And He Shall Be Called. We don't quite have that beginning in this passage. Uh, and maybe it would be a little closer to use Mark 15, 12, uh, which we'll actually look at a little later, where Pilate asks the Jewish leaders, what shall I do then with this one you call the king of the Jews? But it's that title, the king of the Jews. Certainly the Jewish people were looking for a king, one who would reestablish the throne of David and bring Israel back to their glory days. But seriously, a baby born in a barn to poor parents on the wrong side of the tracks? I mean, what kind of king is that? And this contrast continued beyond the events surrounding the birth of this unusual king. Perhaps the most significant contrast is found in the responses to him by people of his day as well as our own. I want to begin by looking at this title as rivalry. The first response to the one who would be called King of the Jews is seen in the person of King Herod. Going back to Matthew chapter 2, verse 3 says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why would the king... And the citizens of Jerusalem be so upset by this news. Now while Herod was called king of the Jews, he was put on the throne by the Romans and wasn't even Jewish himself. He was actually a descendant of Esau. He was an Edomite. His mother was an Arabian princess. So he really had no right to the title or the throne. He should not have been king of the Jews. And in consequence, Herod's throne was very insecure. He lived in terror of any rivals. And so whenever he saw one, or thought he saw one, <laughs> he had him or her liquidated. During his reign of terror, he murdered his favorite wife, he murdered three of his own sons, murdered his mother, all because he suspected they were plotting against him. At one point, Caesar Augustus said, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. It's a pun in the Greek, suos and weos. You could live your life out a long time as a pig in Israel, uh, but not so much if you were a member of the royal family. In today's terms, Herod suffered from severe paranoia. Now these foreigners arrived asking 
who is the one born king of the Jews? And I'm sure Herod's thinking, what do you mean? I'm king of the Jews. Who is this imposter who thinks he's going to take over my throne? In the mind of Herod the Great, there was only one person in Judea who was king of the Jews, and that was Herod the Great. Nobody was going to be a rival to his throne. And as Matthew makes very clear, when Herod wasn't happy, nobody was happy. They lived in fear of Herod. And they knew that when his ire was aroused, trouble was coming. Now I imagine Herod's first impulse was probably to clap these mysterious visitors into irons just asking such a question. But his native shrewdness checked that. He would have to pose interest and ferret out whatever information he could from these visitors in order to kill off a possible rival. So instead, he assembles the priest. He gets them together. We pick it up uh, there in Matthew chapter 2. First, he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law and said, where is the Messiah to be born? And they answered him, in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what was written in the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. They knew immediately where to go. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. There it is. And they knew this is talking about the Messiah. Bethlehem was about five to seven miles away from Jerusalem. Not that far away. So King Herod takes that information. Next he calls in the wise men. He called them in secretly to find out from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report him to me so that I may come and worship him. I'm sure if you were really being honest, he would have said, worship him with air quotes, because that's not what he had in mind at all. <laughs> he wanted to kill him. He wanted to make sure that he could not grow up and take over his throne. And I imagine the wise men probably would have done just that. But later in the chapter, it says that having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, it didn't take long for Herod to figure out he had been duped. When the wise men didn't come back and didn't come back and didn't come back, he decided to take matters into his own hands. So he sent out his soldiers to that little town of Bethlehem and said, find any male child two years and under and kill it. He thought that way there would be no one to take over his throne. And as a result, Herod's obituary forever contains the sad designation he was the first person to reject Jesus Christ. What caused Herod to respond the way he did? Ultimately, it was pride. Herod was hooked on his own importance. His arrogance blinded him to who this baby really was. His ego was threatened the moment he heard the wise men's question that Herod tried to kill Jesus is not surprising. Herod alone wanted that title, King of the Jews. And what this shows us is that in the end, there's really only two responses to Jesus Christ. And you see this contrasted in Herod and the wise men. When the wise men found him, they worshipped him. And when Herod wanted to find him, he only wanted to have him killed. There are many people who perceive Jesus as a rival today. A nuisance. An embarrassment. What C.S. Lewis called the transcendental interferer. <laughs> The one who keeps me from having a good time. The one who keeps me from being really happy. The one who keeps me from fulfilling my desires. 
Because in the end, we all want to be king. Maybe we don't want to be king over a land and a whole bunch of people. We want to be king of me. We want to be king of my life. So we either see Jesus as a threat and determine like Herod to get rid of him. Or we see Jesus as the king of kings and like the wise men, we worship him. Next, I want to move on to see this title as ridicule. And for that, we go to the opposite end of Jesus' life, to John chapter 18, Gospel of John chapter 18. Beginning in verse 33, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you think I'm a Jew, Pilate replied. It was your own people, your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate said, you are a king then. Jesus answered, you are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Kind of hear the cynicism in Pilate's tone, don't you, as you read those verses. And Matthew records what happens next in Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they put, took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. At this point, Jesus had become a comic figure to these Roman soldiers. He stood before them naked as they began to humiliate, degrade, and mock him in every possible way. I know it says they put a robe about him, but the Greek word there is, is just a little, it's a tunic. It was more like a cape, so it really didn't cover anything. They humiliated him. They mocked him. Oh, hail, king of the Jews. It says they put a crown of thorns on his head. The thorns that grow in that part of the world are as long as three inches long. And it wasn't that they just gently put it on him. They, they put it on and then they took the stick and beat it into his scalp. And then probably, maybe the, the worst of all, they, they spit on him. Can you imagine that? Just being, is there anything more degrading than that? They made fun of him. They ridiculed him. And then they led him away to be crucified. When they reached Golgotha, the execution detail offered the condemned men a drink of wine mixed with myrrh as a narcotic. And the scriptures say that Jesus tasted it, but he wouldn't drink it. And you wonder if, if his mind went back to the wise men. Remember one of the gifts they gave was myrrh? He wasn't about to drink it at that point. And in John 19, verse 19, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, so that everybody would understand what it said. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. You see, in crucifixion, there was a, a sign that was attached above the criminal's head. It was called a titulus. And, and it showed the, the crime for which this man was being executed. Signs such as murder, piracy, insurrection, treason, robbery would have been common. But when passersby were going past the crucifixion site on this particular occasion, they would have read, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Eventually, the crowd of sightseers thinned out. We're told that soldiers gambled for Jesus' clothes. We saw there was some women, including Jesus' own mother, who was there weeping. Some of the priests and Jewish officials also stayed mocking him. Matthew records, He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. Again, mocking, ridiculing. Not taking this title seriously at all. And you see foreigners and fellow countrymen alike viewing this title, King of the Jews, as ridicule. They figured if you laugh about something long enough, you don't take it seriously. You know, there's one more response to Jesus as king of the Jews, and that's to see the title as reality. Jesus really is the king of the Jews. And he admitted as much to Pontius Pilate in his trial. John gives us a fuller conversation there. He kind of goes a roundabout way. The other three gospels are very clear. Pilate asked, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. He had no problem taking that title because in reality he was king of the Jews. Paul refers to this in 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 to 16. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Now we see the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not just King of the Jews, King of all. Now you might argue, wasn't Paul talking about God the Father here? In the context, it kind of looks that way. But if you look at Revelation 17, 14, They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because, notice, He is Lord of lords and King of kings. There's no doubt who this verse is talking about. This is Jesus, the Lamb. King of kings and Lord of lords. You also see this title given to Him in Revelation 19, which is going to be our text in a couple of weeks. Billy Graham wrote in his book, The Cradle, Cross, and Crown. There's more to Christmas than the cradle and the cross. There's also the crown. Chiseled into the cornerstone of the United Nations building is a quotation from the Bible that is yet to be fulfilled. Taken from Isaiah 2.4, it reads, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is a thrilling thought. It's often been repeated by men who long for peace. 
And many of these men wonder why peace hasn't come. However, this quotation must not be taken out of context. This passage speaks of a time when the Messiah will reign over the whole earth. This is the era about which Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the time when he who came as a baby in Bethlehem will come back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the baby of Bethlehem, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is the King of the Jews, whether others accept it or not. It is reality. And this brings us to our response. We've seen how King Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Roman soldiers, and the Jewish leaders reacted to this title. The most important question is how will we? How will you respond to Jesus as King of the Jews? King of kings and Lord of lords. We must ask ourselves the question, as Pilate asked the Jewish leaders in Mark 15, 12, what shall I do then with this one you call the King of the Jews? That's a good question. What will you do with him? Jesus coming into this world has altered everything. And he now challenges every man's throne. He knocks at the door of every man's castle. He demands everyone's submission. He came in seeming weakness. But woe to the man or woman who despises his claims. He comes to us. He demands that we submit to His claims. He is God the Son. He is our Maker. He is Savior of the world. But He asks you, what are you going to do with this one called King of the Jews? Most people want nothing to do with Jesus. They wished He had never come. I saw someone in the entertainment world was quoted as saying, I'm glad the Jews killed him, and if he comes back, I'd kill him too. That's the attitude a lot of people have about Jesus, even if they're not bold enough to say it themselves. But the issues are inescapable. Christ has come. We have heard about him. We must decide what we will do whether we will crown him as king or cry out, crucify him, there is no middle ground. Many years ago, A.B. Simpson wrote a hymn based on Pilate's question, what will you do with Jesus? Questions not being posed to the Jewish mob that on that first Good Friday, it's posed to each and every one of us. And the chorus is very haunting as it asks, What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, What will he do with me? The baby of Christmas is the king. You may see him as a rival to your plans, to your power, your control, and you may fight him. You may see him as ridiculous, and you may make fun of him. Or you may see him for who he really is and bow down and worship him. That choice is yours. And that choice means everything. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we acknowledge you for who you really are. You are the king, king of all. You are the creator. You are the one worthy of our worship. But you have not come to conquer. You have come to give us a choice. 
We can pretend to be our own king, or we can crown you king of our life. And if we do, we become part of your kingdom and will live with you forever. If we do not, we will be cast out of your presence into a lake of fire that burns forever where we can pretend to be whatever we want. On that first Christmas, you came to give us that choice. You paid the price for our sins so that the way is available to us, but you've said that we must each choose the way we will go. Each of us will choose what gate we enter, whether it's the broad or the narrow gate. And what path we will take to our final destination. It is my prayer that we will see you for the reality of who you really are. We will not only worship you, but we will crown you as king, king of my life. It is in your name that we pray. Amen.